Hello. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, so, KluCon is a uh, pretty important thing to us um, here at SignalWire. Um, we started the Free Switch community, um, I don't know, like 2005. Um, it used to be a handful of people. Um, now it spreads all over the world. Um, different time zones, different uh, groups, different kinds of problems. Uh, it was rooted in communication. Um, so we started um, trying to bring all that together at least once a year. Uh, and that was an in-person tradition that lasted um, 15 consecutive years um, until uh, last year we sort of ran to a speed bump after the uh, pandemic wouldn't allow us to uh, to have our normal uh, format. So what we decided to do was to take some of the technology we spent all that time working on and use it for something useful. So um, we created a platform so that we could bring information to everyone and let them all hang out and interact um, in real time. And part of the vision as to why we started Free Switch in the first place was to be able to bring together um, all different formats of communication and, and interrupt them with each other and to push the bar forward on that kind of thing. And that was actually the catalyst for why we started SignalWire as well. Um, so bringing it all together, um, we've created this new um, monthly edition of uh, Live KluCon um, that has elements going back to our roots. Um, when we first started doing this, the only way to communicate was over IRC. Um, bunch of us just sitting there talking publicly in the channel. Um, we feel like what we're doing now is similar to a um, live format of that in real time with video. You know, we can we still bring everyone together and we talk about stuff, but maybe we're too lazy to type it all now, so we started doing it um, with our own uh, audio and video. So um, I just wanted to kick off everything and uh in in uh, announced the first version of this uh, and i hope everyone finds it useful and gets a little taste of uh, what it felt like uh, to to start building free switch in the old days thanks Great. So uh, we uh, didn't really do an introduction because it wasn't necessary. <laughs> Absolutely. So thank you, Anthony, CEO of SignalWire and founder of the Frizzwitch project. Uh, so before you leave, Anthony, a uh, few things about that will lead into what we're we'll going to be talking about today, which is uh, stir shaken. Uh, how do you feel about the recent effort about robocalling? And do you think we can help? The open source community can help. Is there anything we can do to stop? I mean, I get four robocalls a day these days. Uh, something is going on in the industry, and I hope we can fix it somehow. Yes, and I hope we didn't create the problem by making the most wide, powerful, and com uh, versatile communication Oops. software ever invented, so that it was easier to build such things. So <laughs> it might be our fault, so it's part of our duty to get rid of it also. But I hate robocalls. I hate them. I, I am almost tempted to spend time answering them just so that I can yell at them. Um, I've created a few kind of tools using our... Um, we, we have a, a new programming environment um, in SignalWire that allows you to program, you know, um, different real-time kind of interactions over voice or video. And um, I think you've had a chance to check this out, Luca, about, um, and I believe you gave a seminar on it that maybe you could give a link to later for people watching. Um, oh, of course. A little tool you can write with some of our platform that will allow you to um, filter out robocalls by uh, by just uh, asking them a simple question to see if they're human or not, similar to what we do on websites, right? So, but shake and stir is obviously the key way. And we invested a lot of time in making sure that shake and stir was put in the hands of all developers in the world. Um, we actually sponsored creating an open source implementation of the entire stack um, it would have been easy to just kind of throw the headers into our SIP module and be done with it, but we felt it was important to push forward to, to maintain, if this isn't an open source thing, it won't really go very far. So um, 
you know, because if only one person has it, it'll hoard it, you know, by now making this protocol open source, um, it'll more likely cause people to create products around it and embed the stack into other tools. Um, it's very important for it to be ubiquitous for it to work, um, similar to the standards around um, securing websites. Like if we don't have it universally adopted, then it won't be of much use. So it's super important for us to spread the word on it and make sure that everyone is using it. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's important. Yeah, something. So I'll be going over some of the technical aspects of what we developed as the open source Libster Shaken Library. But uh, I think the problem, yeah, not a problem, is industry adoption going well? Like, do you think people are actually starting to use Stir Shaken? I think that the carriers are. Um, they're super excited about it. I haven't been asking them every once in a while, and I talked to them for the, for the last year or two, and uh, seems like they're actually taking the date seriously. You know, when we uh, went to um, other great adoptions like this, it took a while. Um, it's going better than IPv6, let's say. <laughs> well, that is not exactly <laughs> the best thing to say. Like, it's better than IPv6. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so maybe I think I think it's uh, it's going to be important. I think what's gonna be key, and uh, I I would like to know your opinion on that, is that instead of leaving it to the big players, uh, people actually start building out into ultimately what will be some kind of a let's encrypt type of initiative. So everybody should have a certificate, and it should be free or cheap. Yeah, well, that's one of the reasons that we made it open source, right? Because we, that's how that can happen. Um, we put, you can create with our open source site, uh, go bring the code into your own project and build um, a test bed. Like we, we're even considering sponsoring one ourselves um, where it's a, a place to create certificates and self host them and make sure, you know, like use them to as a proving ground and, and then pretty soon like you get enough people on it you become trustworthy you create more of those and if there's enough of them in the world like no one is monopolizing on it and i think that's one of the key things that we have to focus on yeah i think there's uh that's gonna be a very uh so uh one i i do have one uh one thing i haven't really experienced in the wild yet are and providers like when you get a call on your phone is there a way to know if the call is verified are providers going to implement a visible uh, way to determine uh, things since there's a standard now i think they will if they can find a way to monetize it oh yeah okay <laughs> so, yeah. well you'll have a lot of us open source people figuring out how to do it anyway but um i mean we have the little lock on our on our browser right so we'll probably get something like that on our phone too that would be awesome. Yeah, that's uh, maybe a special uh, new UTF-8 character just just to symbolize a safe phone call. So yeah, that's. Uh, I think this is going to be a very good effort with the industry. And well, thank you, Anthony. It was very very interesting, and it was an honor having you on uh, this special episode. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. So uh, why don't we take a look at what Stir Shaken is now? Uh, we might have a surprise coming later. I'm still not 100% sure. But in the meantime, let's do just a quick trip to what Stir Shaken is and how we can uh, have it uh, help everybody to lip Stir Shaken. I need share screen privileges, though. Our great event management team. Thank you. I don't know how I got muted. OK, uh, most people probably know me by now. I'm Luca Perdera, lead technical evangelist of SignalWire. And I've done a lot of different things over the last few years, months. I recently discovered I am employee number 15 at SignalWire, so I've been here for a while. But right now, th this evening, we're going to discuss something that's more of an open source initiative, because SignalWire does give back to the community. And we try to do a lot for people who have helped us in the past. <laughs> Some people might uh, ask themselves what exactly is robocalling. Robocalling is when uh, uh, an automated system makes a call to deliver a pre-recorded message. So it's not really just the fact of dialing into someone's phone using an automated system, but it also entails playing 
some kind of automated message, usually pre-recorded, but actually text-to-speech does qualify as a robocall. Sorry, guys. Uh, it's mostly used by... There's legit usages, like uh, political agencies are legit used. Debt collectors, legit sometimes, not so legit other times. And uh, various types of scammers, including the famous extended warranty for your car, which everybody has gotten calls for. Even I did, where I live in... Um, I live in Italy, and I still get calls about that because my number is uh, mostly everywhere, really. Uh, and another very common use is uh, warnings. So uh, something like a snow day or a school or closed or even an accident. or it, it's that, That's, of course, uh, something important. And we'll get to why it's important to be able to determine not only if a call is a robocall, but also if it is a legit call. Because, you know, you want to get a call when something bad happens. You don't want to hear about your extended warranty for a car you don't even own anymore uh robocalls are in general are generally heavily regulated but curiously enough most of the regulation do exclude political messaging which is why you get a lot of messaging during uh, both calls and messages during uh, elections they can be annoying but they can also be very dangerous because there's a high risk of fraud because what they do is simply by placing so many calls you end up hitting someone who will bite the bait right in fact, there was 46 billion robocalls placed in the United States in uh, 2020. So this is 140 calls per every single inhabitant, uh, which is an average of almost three a week. But uh, the Washington, D.C. people actually receive more than one per day. Alaska, and curiously enough, Massachusetts receive less than two per day. Alaska, I can see that. There's not many extended worthy salesmen around Alaska. But Massachusetts, it's just interesting that it's so low uh most of the most of the uh, countries in the middle and 44 of those robocalls are spam or fraud because the um that's that's important so the others are sort of legit or at least try try to as anthony very well said earlier there's an important description distinction which is whether we want to verify a call or to stop them verifying a call means I know if the call I am receiving is actually from the right party that is saying it is from. Uh, the activity of faking a caller ID is called caller ID spoofing. So when you get a call, you could get a call from the White House or from whoever, and it will be all fake. Unless you're, I don't know if you can be and you get a call from the White House, but I hope you get one day, I get one one day as long as it's real. Uh, otherwise, it's probably going to be fake. Uh, that's a, a, why is that an important thing? Uh, car carriers and phone systems don't really enforce color ID. And color ID has been historically just a string that's part of the definition of a phone call. So it's very, very easy to spoof. And the only thing between you and a fake color ID is, well, a carrier enforcing the, the rules, such as signal wire, we enforce all color ID for calls. So it's a... Uh, People cannot spoof colorities from signal wire as far as, uh, aside from a couple side uh, situations, which we, we, are, we, are, we are already covered. And, um, well, stopping a call is a different thing. Stopping calls is really just, now that I know that you're a potential spammer or scammer, I want to stop you. Or maybe I don't have the information because I'm not using stir shaking yet. My carrier is not using stir shaking yet. So we'll, uh, we, the other project that we mentioned earlier uh, shows how to uh, administer a CAPTCHA, so, which is a, a very complicated acronym. Today, we're going to get through three different weird acronyms. One is for CAPTCHA, and the other two are actually stir and shaken, which they sort of, it's a kind of acronym that someone tried to make it fit. So it's a completely automatic public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart. Briefly, because we have other things to look at, it's uh, you certainly encountered the version where uh, some the, your a web page asks you if you're a human by recognizing fire hydrants or bicycles or just clicking a checkbox. Your action of clicking that checkbox actually is measured in various ways, and a computer will do it differently than a person, and that's how you will recognize them. A voice capture will be asking a question, as we do in our demo app, which I'll link in the chat, and I'll give it a link again later is uh, actually a um is actually a um a, a sum of two numbers so hey tell me if uh, 2 plus 2 equals uh, what does 2 plus 2 equal 
a human will answer easily and a non-human will not. And if they answer wrong, we'll send them to talk to Lenny. Lenny is a very interesting voice bot built by an unknown author that just with a few phrases can lead scammers on calls that are up to 10 minutes long just by leading them on with sentences like, oh, yes, yes, yes. So he speaks in a low voice like an old man and uh, it's kind of not intelligible and it will say things like what about my daughter or things like that which leads someone trying to sell you something into thinking you're interested right so it's it's very interesting and i do have a presentation around and maybe we can find a link before this uh descends or we can send it out in an email after the event so going to the meat of the presentation the fcc second order which suspiciously sounds like something out of star wars which we all love at signal Wire, uh, for the Traced Act mandates that calls for any voice service provider not registered with the new FCC shaken robocall mitigation database by June 30, 2021 must be blocked. June 30, 2021 is not very far away, just in case you haven't noticed. It's exactly a couple months. Uh, of course, we'd have had the recurve, but so all, all, all other providers, because effectively that is going to be a problem if we end up having to uh, block calls, etc. Uh, so this is the most important thing. This is about, of course, it's about the US because we're talking the FCC, which is a, a, an American um, organization. But uh, of course, this will be deployed worldwide till Europe has been slow to adapt and adopt this kind of laws only to suddenly jump on something and decide it has to be enforced in the most draconian way. Case in point, the cookie law, where uh, you have to collect those buttons when you say you accept the cookies. Uh, actually, GDPR, so the European Law Compliant websites, have one page long of explanation why you should or should not click that button, uh, because that's mandated by law. So I expect it to happen worldwide. And also, uh, once people see how useful it can be, it will certainly be requested by customers, if not only if not mandated by law. So the second order which is a, um, again, a very cool name. Uh, enter, so how do you fix that? Stir Shaken. Stir Shaken is a technology, a protocol, a set of protocols. It doesn't really have a definition. It is certainly not a protocol. So you won't call Stir Shaken a protocol. Uh, it's divided in two parts. Uh, one is Stir, which again, Secure Telephony Identity Revisited is just an acronym someone tried to make fit. So they call it Stir and Shaken to feel a bit James Bond E, like a 007, uh, is a set of uh, standard documents that define how authenticity certificates should be added to the SIP protocol and verified when a call is received. This is very much how an HTTPS um, interaction operates. So your browser actually has a key that uses to sign a request and, very, and especially uses to verify the certificate from the website you're visiting. So it's sure the website is actually who they say they are, thanks to the fact that the certificate is tied to the IP address of the server and a few other key elements. So that the equivalent of telephony will be me signing a call and my other party verifying that my signature is valid. This, though, will only work on SIP, right? Because SIP is uh, a, a signaling protocol that has a tax portion, so you could put Signature is in there, public keys, private keys. All I won't put private keys in your set, but you do you. Uh, but you can verify them easily. But what about good old telephony? Uh, good old telephony is being uh, regulated and defined and helped by the other half of the stir shaking pair, which is shaken, which means signature based handling of a certain information using tokens. Uh, if you weren't convinced that it was just a made-up acronym, you just know because you know there's no reason why to use tokens. But it's it makes for a cool sounding thing. It's actually just a set of recommendations to deal with calls on the public switched network, so to, which is the PSTN, affectionately known as, uh, mainly to the addition of special information to CNAM records. What does this mean? We'll see it in detail. But uh, a call going through the public switch telephone network does not have a signaling plane. You can analyze. In layman terms, it means that a SIP call can carry its own signature with itself, while a phone call coming over from the PSTN is just a phone call. It's literally uh, an electrical impulse that makes your phone ring. 
And when you pick it up, there's a little modulated signal inside the frequency that just tells you who is calling. But then your display says White House. You can't know if it's the White House. Might be if you just won the Super Bowl, but for all of us other, it's not the case. So um, how do you fix that? Caller ID is displayed on the uh, on displays of uh, phones. Either if you have the contact in your phone, which doesn't apply, of course, but if you don't know number, there is a, C, a service called CNAM where providers and phone number owners can upload a record that explains who the owner of the number is. Uh, of course, those can be spoofed again, but uh, that at least has a... Uh, programming portion to it because CNAM is accessed by a separate system on your phone that effectively is capable of processing something. So StirShaken effectively deals with trying to solve that by adding a certificate to CNAM. So when your home phone gets the call, it can check with CNAM if the, the number is valid and matches the certificate. It's not as effective and it will require changing devices, but it's not nothing. Uh, so we'll focus on Stir because that's uh, most of telephony actually today is on uh, goes over uh, IP list portion of its uh, of its uh, path and by virtue of that any call can be verified by when it's in that portion. Stir uh, Stir works by using a JSON object, which it's again I have, the the acronyms never end here. The acronym fun is called a passport. Uh, I never really found out what that actually means, really. It's just it's a password uh, to convey gra cri cryptographically signed information about a call. We'll see how that looks in code in just a minute. But for now, let's assume it's uh, that that is what it is. Uh, so a passport is generated by a certificate and signed with private keys. So a step back for people who might not know. Uh, the whole world of cryptography and I would say essentially the in whole world of the internet runs around uh, a very important uh, concept, which is PKI, public key cryptography, which you should have a slide in, but I just thought of it. PKI is a way for you to sign something in a way that's not forgeable and someone else to verify it without also having the key. So the difference with symmetric cryptography will be that in symmetric cryptography, I take a document and uh, change it uh, and encrypt it with a password. There are algorithms that are extremely strong to encrypt with a password. But then if I want you to be able to decrypt the message, uh, you will have to have the same password, which exposes the password to the same risks the original document was exposed to. So we're back to square one. Now I'm encrypting the password in another password. And then I can do it forever. At the end, I will still have to give you the password somehow. Uh, while PKI solves this while adding a layer, which is what we're more concerned with, by having a key that is capable of signing and encrypting a document, which is mine and only mine. It's a private key. And a public version of this key for each, each pair has a public and a private version. A public version of this key that can be only used to decrypt the document and verify the document was actually signed with my public key, private key, sorry. So uh, this is what we're particularly concerned here. Uh, the uh, payloads are not encrypted per se. They're assigned, but that also makes them encrypted because it's the same mechanism. Uh, everything runs around PKIs. For a PKI to be valid and reliable, it needs to be based on a certificate that is effectively just a set of characters that is used in the mathematical operations that lead to the generation of the signed and encrypted document uh, that needs to be generated by someone that is trusted. And which, this will be a certificate authority. In the case of Stir Shaken, they're called Shaken Certificate Authorities. You'll ask yourself, why do you need to have a verified certificate to do the signature? Because unless someone else testifies, my public key is actually mine, there's no way to go, uh, th th there's no way to make sure it is. And uh, this is so easy to solve because at the top level, there is there are a few authorities, we'll see a few in a minute, uh, that are able to issue completely trustable root certificates. So they don't need to have anything above them because they're uh, validated by governments. Uh, there's uh, an international trust of people that attend the signatures. And actually, in some cases, there's literally a physical gathering of people that attend the generation of the certificates to guarantee the certificates are uh, not compromised. 
Because if you add one of those certificates, you could forge whatever you wanted. Again, Shaken, going back to Shaken for a second, Shaken includes uh, systems to pass store information through the SS7 network. The SS7 network is what powers the non-digital communication. Uh, so it's just the electricity part of phones, which is the most, actually the most common, or used to be probably. I don't even know. I think there's more cell phones than, uh, than uh, home phones right now, but who knows? Uh, again, the standard covers. Uh, passing store information through the SS7 network, a standard for data to be added to SIP for calls originating in the SS7 network. As we see shortly, store by itself cannot sign a call that is, is not creating. So uh, store will only sign a fully digital call, call originating from one from a free switch server going to another that can be signed by store, but a call coming in from uh, a um, from SS7 into SIP the carrier that's handling the origination origination is the action of taking a call from the public switch telephony system and bringing it into a uh into a digital network a voice over ip network that carrier will have the responsibility by the shaken definition of adding some kind of information so it will be kind of an intermediate intermediate signature the carrier will not sign the call but it will tell you this looks good or this is sus as people used to say when you played Among Us. Um, that is how to send stir information to POTS and points, the reverse. As we said earlier, the main way we have to, uh, the main way we have to get some information to end devices over the PSDN is actually having that in a CNAM system because that's the list is digital. Uh, Shaken also identifies a set of guidelines on what to do when something missing, like, what if I cannot decrypt the call? What do we do if a call is not signed, etc.? These are all guidelines, standards. Uh, one, the, really, there is no standards here. Even the standard I'm mentioning is not really a standard. Right now, it's a set of guidelines. So shaking is the more uh, under construction part of the pro protocol. What there is defined works, and it's in use already. So yeah, certificate authorities in the context of store shaking. Uh, in the United States, the store shaking network was built and managed by the FCC, who assigned the root certificate authority. So they picked a company because that's customary in the US, less so in uh, good old socialist Europe. Uh, so we, uh, but the US did pick a private company, which is iConnective, and iConnective holds the root certificates for the store shaking system. Uh, that will probably eventually, and I think that's actually planned, transition into some kind of foundation. Uh, there will be many other CAs started by other entities because remember, all you need is a way to get a certificate that is trusted without having to have anything above it. So it is a red certificate to start your own little let's encrypt of telephony. Uh, other trust net, again, other, uh, Jeff just said, it's not, that's not the only trust network. So the FCC slash iConnective network is not the only trust network. I feel like one of them will eventually win out or there will be uh, many players who really doesn't matter where you're using in the sense that HTTPS right now, if you remember, if you're old like me and at least in internet years, uh, when we started out, there was a big fuss about having that lock up in the browser. Now everybody wants that lock, but more important, everybody will know the name of the company who issued certificates for the, their favorite websites. There will be very sign. There will be a few others. Uh, Europe uh, has a couple of very strong ones, including Aruba. And um, you will pay attention, right? You will care and say, oh, this is signed by VeriSign. So this is a, uh, an important bank because it has a, a VeriSign certificate. And it used to be that the more reputable companies were more expensive. Now with Let's Encrypt, anybody can generate a certificate. And I think they still sell certificates because Let's Encrypt doesn't cover all cases, but they become very cheap, ubiquitous, and you don't really ask where they come from. All you care about is that your browser says they are trustable, which is what we envision happening in the industry. So there is one root certificate. Fine, there will be more, and we need to build more. And uh, no matter who sets up the network, you do need a trusted root certificate. How do you become a trusted root certificate? 
how Let's Encrypt did it is founding a foundation and then going to uh, governments and universities and getting a charter signed, essentially. Then you do this certificate generation ceremony, which actually looks striking like some kind of uh, uh, internet cult thing where people meet in a dark place. It's not really dark, but and numbers randomly generated and it's handed out. And uh, it's kind of like, uh, so uh, it always reminds me on uh, of when I read about the birth of the hairs in the French kingdom back in the 1700s. The queen was actually giving birth in public in front of a few people just to make sure that the child was never exchanged for another. Uh, so that's probably why they got the revolution. So let's not get there. So let's actually, actually do it in a more civilized way this time around. So, okay, so now you got your certificate. You're all set. Uh, I connected or whatever gave you one. You have a root certificate. You did the weird giving birth live scenario and you have one now. And now you want to call someone. So uh, keep in mind that, generally speaking, the certificate is not going to be uh, in your hands. It's going to be in the hands of your provider because that they are the ones who originate the call. It is totally possible for you to sign calls yourself locally, but it does require a little bit of infrastructure, which we'll see very shortly. Uh, so let's say it's a service hosted on SignalWire. Why not? Just a random provider. Uh, so. SignalWire would like to sign the call on behalf of Bob using the shaken certificate. It obtained for Bob from a FCC a certified CA. So uh, it's not really for Bob. This uh, SignalWire this uh, SignalWire will own that certificate. So in this case, what uh, the carrier will actually be telling Alice when she received the call is, "Here I vouch for Bob being Bob. This is Bob's phone number, and he's calling you right now." In layman's terms, that's what is happening. So it's not Bob himself saying, hey, Alice, I'm calling you, because that will not make much sense if you think about it. Uh, if you ask someone if they are actually Bob, they will always say yes if they're, they have interest in saying so. Uh, so a third party, which is the carrier, verifies and says, hey, yeah, this is actually Bob. Uh, Lipster shake and command uh, does generate the uh, the passport that gets put into the SIP. So let's take a look at what the code says. As you say, we have as you see, we have a command line tool that allows you to do all of the interactions. And honestly, this was a very good intuition from the open source team that developed the Lipster shake and product library, not a product, because uh, having a CLI option allows you to integrate far easier into your flows, because if your actual platform doesn't have the ability to do the signing or the checking in real time, they can most certainly pipe the logs to somewhere where the command line tool can interact with them, or you can generate the headers before you inject them into the call. So it makes it far easier to integrate. And in fact, it's being used by a lot of people already. So as you see, we have a private key. Uh, that we just put a random uh, random URL to. But more important, look at the dash dash URL parameter, which says shaken signal wire cloud dot sp dot pam. That is the public certificate for the pair where the private key is referenced before. What this does is uh, allows us to tell the other side which certificate to use to verify the call. What I was saying is that you will serve the certificate. So you will really sign the calls yourself because the certificate will have to resign in a place where the other party can go and pick it up through HTTP. So you will need that. It's possible to set it up, but Akiris uh, and Akiris will be more will be more reputable. Again, even if you obtain a valid certificate, it will still be equivalent to you asking someone if their name is actually their name. If they have interest in saying so, they will say yes anyways, even if it's not true. Few other things. Uh, we want an attestation of type B. There's various types of attestations. Uh, this is the, the simpler. Uh, we say was the original, was uh, the uh, destination. Uh, this, this should be phone numbers usually. Then we give it an ID. The ID is an internal ID that uh, refers to the call in the carrier that Bob is placing. And then we output the passport to the uh, passport file just to look at it. It's really just generated JSON, so it will print it to the console if you're in the, in the console. If you take a look at the right hand side, and that's easier to look at uh, that the mm, compressed version will see shortly, uh, you'll see that uh, it's explaining how the certificates were generated, how the signature was generated, where to go for the public certificates that's used for the signature, and who's calling and who's receiving, including the IAT, which is the actual phone number of the originator. So this is all you need to do the second step, sending the header. So this is SIP. 
which means we'll have to um, we'll have to sign we'll have to put package the previous JSON in a form where it is secure, not tamper proof. Because of course, if you send the JSON in clear, anybody could change it, and it's not really signed; it's just JSON. So it will be again Bob saying his Bob. He will always say his. But what do we do is we encrypt and sign it using our private key. So as we mentioned earlier in the PKI infrastructure, a private key can sign and encrypt, and the public key can decrypt and uh, verify the signature. By the way, this means those headers by, are by no means secret. It means they are not possible to modify, which is different and important in this case. We don't really care if someone reads the headers that we're sending because it's just information. But what we care about is that if those headers are modified, so that instead of Bob, it says uh, Charlie, Alice will be able to tell because the signature will be different. So it will be wrong. So there's, uh, her system, when we verify, which we'll look at in the next slide, will tell her, hey, something's wrong here. The signature is not right. So even if you could inject yourself into the SIP flow, there's no way you can generate a valid signature that actually uses that uh, that same uh, private key and has the same result. Because you don't know the private key. You only know the public one. This is uh, a concept that people have a little bit of, I wouldn't say problems, but it's hard to wrap your head around the fact that uh, sometimes uh, you can put information in public and it'll still be secure. But this is the case. So abridging out a lot of SIP, uh, anybody who knows SIPs can see what, what's going on here, the various headers, there's STP down, uh, should, should be here. But more important, we're adding this header with a few more uh, bits of information, which algorithm is used to create the signature. This is important because otherwise the other endpoint will have to guess. It can, but it takes longer. Uh, it's a, sort of a reference saying, hey, this is a shaken signature. So again, it's possible that the other endpoint knows what to do, but this helps them. While, of course, they need to have the info flag that says where the public key certificate is. Otherwise, no verification, no signatures, no security. Cool. So I got muted. OK. Uh, of course, so I haven't said that. But if anybody has a question, just drop it in chat. I'm happy to take a look. Um, last part. So Bob's provider has used the certificate to generate a passport that says, hey, this call is actually from Bob. The only way to verify that is using that certificate. So what happens is that the receiving party will take the passport out of the SIP header, download the reference certificate that is in the URL, Check the signature using the public key that is the in the certificate, and in uh, at the end check if the uh, HTTP if the certificate we're using to decrypt and uh, verify the signature of the document is actually signed by a, one of a trusted CA root. So a certificate as a certificate chain. There's a mechanism in PKIs that allows you to go up the chain until you find out if a certificate is valid or not. Or it's be signed by a trusted CA root. Uh, there's a lot of output I can show you if you'd like, but there is, it's pages and pages in the verbos version. Uh, but mostly, uh, what you get at the end is you get a verified JWT matches the reference certificate. And the stir shaken tool will actually exit with uh, zero in Unix parlance. So it's easy to integrate. If it exits with zero, the certificate was valid. You don't really care about much else. Note that, uh, generally speaking, you don't really care about the output of the description. You mostly care about the fact that someone uh, has told you, yeah, this call is actually from Bob, and we're sure because reasons. Great. So this is really what it is. How did we achieve this? With the help of a, our uh, wonderful open source team and other uh, people from the SignalWire company, uh, SignalWire has a dedicated team that works on the open source projects such as Frizzwitch and Lips Are Shaken and other stuff. We like to give back. And also, as Anthony said very well earlier, it makes the whole industry better if people don't, if people start stopping robocalls. Uh, Lips Are Shaken is an open source library sponsored by SignalWire, but it is open source. You can download it. You can do whatever you like. You can submit pull requests. We'll be happy to give it a code review. Uh, I, I hope you don't get code reviews from a few of the more skating engineers we have, but they're very nice and they're very knowledgeable. Uh, 
Its goal is to make it easy to use stir shaken in most applications. As I said, it's possible to use it. At, so the name lib will uh, uh, suggest it's a library to, especially to the Unix people. Uh, but it also bundles a, a command line tool, which is actually very useful. As I said, uh, I, I think more people are using the CLI version than the actual lib right now because of ease of integration and testing. It's still very new, so using the CLI allows you to shell out, do things, and then figure out things later. Uh, Lipster Shaken is, of course, already part of Frizzwitch, and it's used by Camellio, a Stir Shaken module. Uh, so uh, I will say that makes it probably right now is the most widely adopted Stir Shaken implementation solely by the number of Frizzwitch and Camellio nodes that exist in the world. I think they're like the top two deployed by number telephony platforms. Uh, if you, well, there's asterisk too, but the, a lot of those are uh, old versions in boxes. So uh, I will say that is, uh, that's that's a good thing to say. Uh, it was tested through extensive interoperability sessions with other leading shaken implementations through Transnexus. Transnexus. And there was a lot of work at the recent um, conference called OpenSipConf, where there was another round of interoperability testing before the final release. Uh, what else? It's a, it's a great library. It's very, it could be very technical. Uh, so uh, maybe we can take a, look, take a look at a few of the examples. But my goal here was trying to make it about the um, possibilities that it introduces into the industry, not really about the library itself. So I'm happy to help. I'm happy to answer questions. And we can even do something later. Or maybe we can do a separate technical session for the more C-oriented people, which is I'm not super at it. But so uh, Lipster Shaken doesn't only generate and verify passports. Uh, it does all these things and more. You can use it to generate the SSL keys you need for the signing. You can use them for the C CSR. A CSR is an intermediate request that you need to send to a certificate authority so they can give you your certificate. So it's something you'd use to generate something that your CA will ask for. You, of course, you can generate certificates. Uh, they will be end entity self issues and self signed, which respectively means end entity means it's the certificate you will use to sign calls, but you cannot use their certificate to sign other certificates. Uh, Self-issue that some signed are really just test level certificates. So if you if you can technically, as I said earlier, you can always issue a certificate. The problem with the certificate is that it won't be trusted, not that it won't work. So you can totally self-issue a certificate and just sign it, and it will work for testing. And of course, most clients do support the ability to use a self-signed certificate when you're in development mode. Uh, you can generate a password for a call, which is a saw. You can, it, it even bundles a simplified demo CA. So if you had a root certificate, you could use Libster Shaken to run your own CA. So other people or even your servers or your services could submit CSR to so your own CA to create certificates. Are you starting to see a pattern here? If you had a root certificate, you could go all the way to the endpoint using only Libster Shaken. So as soon as there are, as soon as there are, uh, open source or a consortium based root certificates, you will be able to do this at Let's Encrypt style. It even supports the actual Let's Encrypt originator protocol, which is ACME. ACME is used to generate a uh, end entity certificate from a um, from a root certificate from a CA using a specific set of interchanges. Uh, if you use Let's Encrypt, you're asked to either if you want to um, verify via DNS you ask if you want to verify via uh, HTTP request. This is going to be similar only in telephony. So you can verify through a SIP pattern. You can verify through other mechanisms which are still being defined. Probably something about putting something in the CNAME of the number or just calling into a number, which is actually a good use. You can verify a password with the certificate path, which means you can verify if the certificate is actually valid. The certificate used to sign is actually valid, which is different than verifying if the signature is valid. Going back to earlier, I can sign you a self-signed certificate. You can decrypt it using my self-signed public key. That means the signature is valid, but not that it is trustable. Because I just made up that certificate. So it doesn't really, it's not necessarily yours or mine. Uh, you can dump the password. So it's uh, generally used by um, used by scripts to dump the content of the password and then iterate in the JSON to get some information out of it. Uh, you can uh, specify timeouts, and you can uh, 
create certificates with a hash name. So you mean it means you can cache certificates in a secure way to avoid having to grab certificates every time without exposing your uh, network to the risk of people grabbing those certificates and using them because hashing out the names means only you know which ones they are. Cool. So um, any questions? Uh, we have a giveaway of a uh, gift card if anybody wants to ask a question. Uh, We'll, uh, <laughs> the winner will be announced via email, but at least if there is anything we can do, I'm happy to answer. Well, we'll pick someone from the list, I guess. Cool. So thank you very much. Oh, I forgot to change the date on here. <laughs> it's, it's May 5th. Well, whatever. Uh, see you next Wednesday, whatever that is. I don't even know. I've been here for so long. <laughs> Jokes aside, the uh, there there is a, there will be an event next week. Uh, every weekend, every uh, Wednesday, we have an event called Livewire where we show some of the signal wire technology, and also there we there is always a ClueCon Weekly uh, where we interview interesting speakers from the industry and outside the industry, and uh, they help us figure out what's going on in different uh, way and uh, with the different set of eyes that we usually do on our uh, in our mm, company and in our everyday work and again ClueCon is going to come back in october we're going to keep uh, things going by doing a monthly event uh, every last week of the month i think and uh look forward to fantastic speakers and a lot of fun and uh, maybe a dangerous demo or two uh, if we can get something to catch on fire on camera that will be super great uh cool so Thanks, everybody, for joining. This has been the first of a long list of events. And uh, thanks to the wonderful team that put this together. Thanks to Anthony, who had to, of course, attend to more important matters. and But he gave us a very good introductions. And I'll see you next time.